Mark Twain once said, never tell fish stories where people know the fish, and never tell them where people know you. So I'm going to violate that. I'm going to tell you a fish story. Some of you might be wondering, what do fish have to do with the Foothills Restoration Forum? So if you're thinking that, you're part of a larger crowd. Well, I, I hope to make this a metaphor about some of the things that face us all, whether it's fish or native grasslands or a variety of landscapes that David has just referenced as wilderness. So what I hope to talk about are these two subjects. And just to make this relevant, there's a lot of young faces in this audience. And I'm going to impart some wisdom to you that someday, someday, you'll step into the bathroom and look in the mirror and you'll think to yourself, damn, I'm old. And you'll think, when did this happen? And of course, it happens every day. It happens progressively, insidiously, additively, and cumulatively. And just like us getting old and our faces deteriorating, so does the landscape and some of the critters on the landscape. And so part of this is about talking about that progression in time. Now, time is something that does march on, but our memories may not be perfect about it. For example, some of you who have had toothaches in the past may yearn for the reintroduction of cocaine tooth drops. Well, it was something that was prevalent in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, but, you know, sadly has been legislated out of existence. You know, we've had a bunch of changes as well. You know, there used to be a time when women's bathing costumes, you're, uh, there had to be a measurement and there couldn't be much knee showing. So, thankfully, we changed that to a perspective in, in the world. But in terms of our landscape, it hasn't been all that long ago, certainly within recorded history, that this landscape harbored hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of bison. And, of course, that went very quickly. As we know, the history of bison demise on the Great Plains and certainly within our landscape. And part of that, at least in an Alberta context, was followed by things like the Trans Transcontinental Railroad, which changed forever the perspective that we have about the plains and about our landscape. Now, in early days, the uh, Northwest Mounted Police were tasked with inventorying some of the resources of the landscape that they were, uh, were uh, are under their control. And one of the things that they were asked to do was give an inventory of fish and wildlife populations. And here's something from a uh, Northwest Mounted Police officer in his report from the Calgary Detachment. Now, this was an individual who had come out with the Northwest Mounted Police in 1876. And so he's reflecting over the 14 years that he's been in what would later be called Alberta. And I think these words are prophetic because it does show that changes on our landscape were happening much more quickly and much sooner than our recent history and our memory of recent history would have us believe. So when I fished about 14 years ago, the rivers teemed with fish, 1876. Now it is much different, 1890. The march in time has started. So what he was talking about were native species, the three predominant native species in the streams of the eastern slopes, bull trout, mountain whitefish, and west slope cutthroat trout. The other interesting excerpt was from a constable who was reporting from the Pincher Creek Detachment, and he was speaking about cutthroat trout, also known as speckled or brook trout, and he talked about the distinguishing feature of the red patch, but he also talked about this red patch being prevalent in fish of 12 and a half pounds. Any of you remember a cutthroat trout that even comes close to 12 and a half pounds from one of our eastern slope streams? Again, it's a measurement of the march of time. Well, Francis is, is a, well, let's see, that's the trouble with having too many old people in the audience. They kind of spoil your message. Now, on the Bow River, that's one of the earlier photographs that I was able to glean from the Glenbow archives. It shows a catch of, of cutthroat trout.
from the Bow River where it flows through Calgary. And of course, a picture of Calgary in that uh, late 1800s. By the way, this was the last time you could get parking in downtown Calgary. <laughs> well, that's Calgary today. Yes, there are still trout in the Bow River, but they're not native cutthroat trout and they're not native bull trout. So again, the march of time has changed the perspective in terms of fish species biodiversity. One of the earlier pictures from our country, this is from Callum Creek. Uh, Callum Creek is a tributary to the Old Man River, flows in just south or just uh, east of the Highway 22 bridge. And in that picture are arrayed about 70 bull trout and cutthroat trout. Well, Callum Creek doesn't have either of those species in it anymore. Here's an interesting photo of 1902 from Trout Creek. Trout Creek is a little tributary that flows off the eastern flank of the Porcupine Hills into Willow Creek. There are 125 cutthroat trout in that picture. I'm assuming this is a day's catch for those four people. I don't think, uh, given their clothing and the fact they've got a young child with them, indicates that they were probably just out for a day's fishing. So that 125 trout probably relates to almost 200 pounds of cutthroat trout. Well, remarkably, there are still cutthroat trout left in the headwaters of Trout Creek, although they are under siege from a variety of land use activities. Again, it's, it's painting a picture of the cornucopia of riches that this landscape had in our earlier times. Here's an uh, article from the Calgary Herald in 1903. These two guys went out on Fish Creek. Fish Creek now flows through the city of Calgary, part of its Fish Creek Provincial Park. And those two guys came, out, came back with 400 fish from a day's fishing. Now you might think to yourself, these people were rapacious and greedy, and uh, no wonder we don't have trout in these waters anymore. Well, there were big trout. This is a uh, series of bull trout that are framing a catch of cutthroat trout. These, by any stretch of the imagination, are big fish from the Belly River in those earlier times. And similarly, from the uh, this is probably a catch of bull trout from the St. Mary's River. The uh, little boy is uh, looking up and wondering why his dad has a bull trout cap. Now, bull trout aren't part of most of the St. Mary's River anymore. And so again, it's a march of time that shows us the changes that have happened in as little as one or two of our human generations. This is a bull trout captured from uh, the confluence of Mill Creek and the Castle River. Um, two things to note. One, fishermen dressed much better in those days. And second of all, that's an 18 to 20 pound bull trout. It would be a stretch of the imagination to think that an 18 to 20 pound bull trout would still exist in any of our waters. But it is an indication of what was probably prevalent and common in that era. Now, we don't necessarily need pictures of big fish to convince us of what the past looked like in terms of aquatic resources. Sometimes we just look at the size of the fishing poles. And that's an indication that, damn, these fish must have been big. And sadly, equestrian-based angling has fallen out of favor completely. It, again, it's an indication of how easy it was to catch fish, and, and another mode of transport that maybe we need to get back to, and uh, park our quads and our four-wheel drives and get back to horse-based fishing. Of course, the backdrop of this is the landscape was changing. We were using the landscape, we were using the landscape in a variety of ways. Logging was probably one of the first big land use footprints on the landscape, albeit at a relatively small scale. Although when you see pictures like this of a log jam on the Highwood River, it's, uh, it's an indication that uh, these land use activities were starting to march across the foothills and mountains of, uh, of Alberta. And of course, all of this was uh, directed, and remember, there were no roads in those days to haul timber, so the motor transport was down rivers. This is a log boom at the city of Lethbridge to catch those logs. And you can imagine, given that uh, previous picture of the log jam on the Highwood River and this, 
that uh, changes to physical habitat in rivers was changing just as a, as a consequence of the mode of transport of these logs, not just the logging activity. Of course, fires rage through this uh, part of the world uh, for a variety of region, reasons, uh, trappers, uh, explorers, prospectors, and of course, uh, locomotives from the CPR. And one of the modes of dealing with this was to graze uh, a lot of the uh, grass down to remove the fire hazard. And this is one of those scenes from the flanks of Crow's Nest Mountain using sheep as a mechanism to do that. Uh, profoundly changing, as you will recognize, some of the runoff characteristics uh, from uh, snowmelt and rainfall. Now, in the backdrop of this, of course, was the settlement of uh, Alberta, uh, both in terms of immigrant trains and uh, the picture of the uh, breaking of sod is my grandfather. So, uh, you've identified where the problem is, and I'm just his progeny trying to fix the issue. Now, people began to get concerned, though, even in those very early years. So, these are some comments from an early Dominion Fisheries Commission that went across the province, and in particular they met in Calgary, McLeod, and High River. And you can read some of these comments that they produced at that time. And so it wasn't as if we were completely ignorant of the changes happening to the landscape and what those land use changes meant in terms of aquatic resources and perhaps other resources. One of the things they pointed out was that of all of the native fish, they thought that cutthroat trout was worthy of preservation. So this is 1913, very early in our province's history. And yet, the march of land use went on. The, uh, the damming of uh, the Bow River and many of its tributaries, for example, the Cascade River, the, uh, the uh, Spray River, and the Kananaskis River, were all part of the electrification of Alberta. And uh, of course, we're benefiting from that right now in terms of power production. But these have profound changes. This, uh, this was a catch of cutthroat and bull trout from the Kananaskis system before it was dammed. Those uh, species no longer exist in this situation. This is a catch of cutthroat trout from the Spray River system, which no longer exists, again, because of hydropower development. Of course, the beginning of, of Alberta's uh, rise to ascendancy in the Dominion of Canada because of its oil and gas resources started not far from here, and you can imagine the profound impact some of those uh, early drilling programs had on aquatic resources. Not only in terms of changes to habitat, some of the pollution, but also the people that came in and the fishing pressure that happened as a result. Now, we think that off-highway vehicle activity is just a recent phenomena. Well, of course, it started a long time ago, but just the extent of linear disturbance of roads and trails wasn't as prevalent and so it meant that there were lots of refuges, uh, places that were largely uh, unroaded and uh, free from a large, lot of the fishing pressure that would have occurred otherwise. But because of these changes, native fish stocks declined and there was a cry to replant, to reseed these systems and they tried with native species like cutthroat trout but native species just aren't as tractable as some of the hatchery reared products like rainbow trout. And so they moved very quickly to rainbow trout and overstocked a lot of our native populations with rainbow trout, brook trout, and brown trout. The rainbow trout is particularly pro problematic because it engages in unsafe sex with our cutthroat trout and causes crosses that uh, don't provide the same sort of evolutionary benefit that the native species do. Now, because of the stocking of non-native species, there started to become a bit of an antipathy towards our native species. And this is an example from the, uh, the High River News in 1926, where people were urging the government to blow those damn bull trout out of their pools with dynamite so they quit eating rainbow trout. And that antipathy, I'm sad to say, probably still reigns in terms of some people's attitude about native species, particularly bull trout. The other thing that I think was happening, and certainly was part of the, the change in landscape quality and in integrity, 
was simply the additive effect of everything going on all the time. And the crow's nest watershed is a good one to look at. All sorts of things were happening in terms of mining, logging for mine crops and, uh, and ties, fires that raged, um, the, uh, the development of the railroad, of course. And all of those things added up to the point where the bull trout population of the upper crow's nest river was extirpated. Now, remarkably, this population, a unique population that, that uh, reared in the streams and tributaries of the Crow's Nest River and found a home in Crow's Nest Lake, they survived decades of fishing, both legal and otherwise. My uncle was a miner in the Crow's Nest Pass and he talked about his colleagues and their use of CIL wigglers, which is a euphemism for dynamite. Remarkably, those bull trout survived that, but they couldn't survive the progressive change in the landscape until only one spawning tributary, Allison Creek, was left. And that changed because of a channelization project to ensure that a bridge on Highway 3 was protected from flooding. That uh, caused a gravel bar to build up. The bull trout couldn't ascend to spawn, and within 10 years, the bull trout population was gone, and gone forever. Now, the point is, we don't often remember, because our memories are short, and we don't often look backwards over our shoulders, we always look forward. So just to provide a perspective on this, this is a, a photograph taken by the Dominion Survey crew in 1890 on a portion of Willow Creek, a portion of Willow Creek quite near the mouth near Fort McLeod. And this was a portion where these three nattily dressed anglers in 1902 are standing holding about 40 pounds of cutthroat trout. Well, if we march forward in time from that previous image, that's what the image looked like in 1980. So a tremendous amount of changes. Now, there's still hope for this stretch, but the creek no longer contains native cutthroat or bull trout, or for that matter, any trout species. So a massive change in that short time span. The point is, is that the use of these archival photographs isn't to convince you that all of the changes happened yesterday. They're still happening today. History wasn't made yesterday, it's still being made today. And the things that happen on our landscape are still having some of the same impacts on aquatic resources, on water quality, and on landscape integrity as they did in the past. Things like the roads that really were built to have a very short shelf life, and yet they're still there and they're deteriorating. And every time we have a flood event, these, these culverts blow out and the sediment has to go somewhere following the immutable laws of gravity and it ends up downstream. If, uh, if there was a mantra that fisheries biologists chant about what are the essential ingredients to create livable conditions for native trout and, and other trout, it's this. It's got to be cold, it's got to be clean, it's got to be complex, and it's got to be connected. And unfortunately, what we're creating is a landscape that's warmer, dirtier, simpler, and fragmented. And that has profound implications on the ability of native species to survive and thrive. And part of it is, is this stuff. It's the mud. It bleeds from every logging cut block, every road, every off-highway vehicle trail. It, uh, it adds to the total su suspended sediment shown in the bottle. But most importantly, it also becomes incorporated into the substrate materials and actually binds those substrate materials together in a cement-like formation that makes it very difficult for cutthroat and bull trout to spawn in. In fact, bull trout and cutthroat probably need a pickaxe to break through some of this material. And that is part of the cycle that unfortunately leaves these populations without alternatives to bolster their population. This is a, uh, a time step on a spawning pool in Hidden Creek. Hidden Creek is the uh, epicenter for bull trout spawning for the old man system. Um, you can see the lower one in August of 2012, clear water. Uh, for those of you who are really sharp-eyed, you can see the two bull trout engaged in a romantic interlude on the stream bottom. The upper one 
2013. This follows logging of Hidden Creek and the flood of 2013. The uh, sediment accumulation now is such that bull trout reds, the nests that bull trout females build, has gone from about 100 a year down to a low of 15. And so that doesn't bode well for the entire old man population. And of course, we like to engage in multiple use in Alberta. And uh, whether it's off-highway vehicles or fishing, I think we have to ask the question, are these things compatible? And given the intensity and frequency of these land, use, uh, land uses, uh, should we be looking at different ways of protecting water quality and landscape integrity? The reason is this. I was out on Gold Creek uh, just before and during a summer thunderstorm. You can see that in the upper corner, Gold Creek is running clear as gin. That summer storm came along and within 10 minutes from the series of roads and trails, all of which are used extensively by off-highway vehicles, the sediment bleeds into that system every time it rains every snow melt event and creates this sort of a situation which doesn't meet those criteria for clean. If, uh, if any of you doubt me, then I suggest you do a little Google trip. Take a little flight on Google. This is a little flight that I took over the headwaters of the Old Man River. You can see Dutch Creek and, and the, and the uh, Racehorse Creek there. And if we zoom into a portion of Dutch Creek and the headwaters, that's what the landscape footprint looks like. It exceeds any threshold, any biological, any ecological threshold that we certainly know today in terms of the ability of native trout to survive and thrive with that sort of footprint. Unfortunately, and I think this is something that may resonate with many of you who are engaged in, in the protection and management of native grasslands, is that there is still an attitude that it's not happening. And so my point is just because you don't see it, or won't see it, or can't see it, doesn't mean it isn't happening. Ogden Nash hit it right on the nail. Progress may have been all right once, but it went on too long. And so I'm not suggesting that progress or land uses are bad. But what I'm suggesting is that we've exceeded some critical thresholds. And if native trout are the gold seal of water quality and tell us that we're managing the landscape well, their demise should tell us that we've failed miserably at that landscape management goal. And just to refine that, as a bull trout, and our fisheries colleagues in the Fish and Wildlife Division, or whatever it's known as these days, have done fish sustainability indexes. And it, this is sort of a, a cumulative effects analysis of the things that affect fish species at a watershed scale. And the fact that you see a lot of red all up and down the eastern slopes should be an indication that bull trout are in trouble. They're also, the yellow is at risk. In fact, the problem is there are very few watersheds that are refuges where there isn't a land use impact that's affecting bull trout populations. To put that in perspective for us, this is the Old Man watershed, inclusive of the castle. There are two epicenters for bull trout spawning in these two watersheds. One is Hidden Creek. I've talked about the land use issues there. The other one is Mill Creek. Now, Mill Creek was going to be logged, but the, uh, the uh, park status that happened this spring has changed that in terms of changing at least logging and its future in, in the castle watershed. We don't know what the effect will be on off-highway vehicle travel, but when you've only got two epicenters for bull trout left at a watershed scale, there aren't an awful lot of options. And so the other thing that happened, and, and uh, is of concern on Mill Creek is a major landslide happened on Mill Creek this last summer, which temporarily blocked the creek and added tremendously to the sediment loads in that system. So here you have the two epicenters, both of which now are under a bunch of, of situations 
that uh, may not bode well for the bull trout populations that need them to keep generations of bull trout alive. In terms of cutthroat, this is what the distribution of cutthroat looked like in the Old Man watershed pre-1900. Imagine cutthroat down to Lethbridge and scattered almost continuously through the rest of the watershed upstream of Lethbridge. Well, this is what the uh, distribution looks like now. The green are pure strains, that's genetically pure. The yellow are almost pure. And what it tells us is we've lost connectivity, as well as a tremendous amount of the range. We only have about 5% of the historic levels of cutthroat trout left in the Bow and Old Man watersheds. And so the places that they're left, up in the upper headwaters, you know, do we think of these as the best of the best? Do we think of them as the last of the best? I think they're the last of the last. And again, none of these, at least within the province, have any measure of protection yet from a variety of land use activities that could have them wink out of existence. So both of these species, bull trout and cutthroat, have been designated as threatened. Threatened means that if you don't do anything, they'll slide into endangered. And if they slide into endangered, there's probably a good chance that they'll slide into the category of extirpated, or even worse, gone. Now, are we making the call? Are we doing some crisis counseling for bull trout and cutthroat trout? Well, we have management plans for them. We have recovery strategies for cutthroat trout. One is in the works for bull trout. But the real test, as Elva Leopold said, is what happens out on the back 40. And when you go out into the woods today, based on what you now know, I think you'll see that we're not doing much on the ground in terms of protecting bull trout and cutthroat habitat. And I think that's the major issue. So, that tiny little cutthroat trout, some of these exist in watersheds and streams that are so narrow that if you put your foot across those streams, you dam up the flow. It's amazing that these, these uh, critters have made a go of it, you know, since continental and alpine glaciation melted in these systems. So I think we have to invoke Dr. Zeus here. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Now, let's go back in time. Did anyone raise a flag about bison? Well, a few did. Did we do anything about it? Not much. What happened to bison? Well, they disappeared, and we gathered up the bones and ground them up in the fertilizer, and we pretty much forgot what the uh, landscape looked like under the influence of all of those huge ungulates. So, do we have a memory problem? What do we want? Better memory. When did we want it? Want what? So memory. Memory. If you can remember what you had for breakfast this morning, that's a darn good start. Just a little time step here. In the 1940s, this is Kevin Van Tegan's grandfather. He's fishing for cutthroat trout in the Spray River, where they don't exist anymore. And from his angling diaries, he could catch four to six pound cutthroat trout every second or third cast. Well, in the 1990s, I took my friend Murray into the Carbondale drainage, which probably at one time, based on archival photographs, had very similar populations of cutthroat trout and bull trout. And we fished for an entire afternoon so that Murray could catch that one fish. Now, was Murray dismayed about his lack of angling prowess or the lack of fish? No. He was damn happy to catch one fish. And I think that's the issue, is if we don't think about where we come from, we think today is the full pie's worth of resources. Churchill said it best, the further you can look back, the more you can see forward. And it deals with this phenomena called shifting benchmarks. The inability to use our memory, the inability to use historical references to create a benchmark in time that we measure today's environment and today's catch against. This was put to me when I was working on 
Eastern Slope Trout Regulation reviews by an elderly angler. He fixed me with a steely glare and he said, I would consider your best day of fishing as one of my worst. That's shifting benchmarks. And it dawned on me that I'm subject to this as well. So Lovelock said it best, if we continue business as usual, doing everything everywhere all the time, anytime, our species, that's us, will never again enjoy the lush and burdened world we had only a hundred years ago. And those archival images, those old black and whites, of what we had in terms of the cornucopia of aquatic resources should remind us what we once had and what has largely gone missing. So what we need to do is this, and I would encourage all of you to think about this, is holding up a mirror on the pace, the intensity, the temporal and the spatial consequences of landscape change. Because if we don't, we'll continue the trend that we're currently on. And then, do what you can. Do what you can to stop making things worse and try to make things better. And the last message, in case you're tired of my messages, is this. We're not going to uh, get back to the fish populations that we had remembered by that Northwest Mounted Police Constable in 1867. We're not going to get back to the fish populations of the archival photographs around the turn of the century. But we still have the chance, the opportunity, to stop the negative trend, to maintain current populations, and increase them to the point where they have enough of a population base that they can survive and thrive. Why would we do that? Well, because of this. Wildlife, including native fish, are part of our myths, they're part of our history, they're part of our lives, they're part of our landscapes. I talked about the gold seal of water quality being native fish still present in our watersheds. And they are a measuring stick of the health of our world. Unfortunately, because of this phenomenon called shifting benchmarks, they can slip to become only a fragment of our memory, and even worse, we might forget about them altogether. And so as uh, Pat Graham from the Montana Game and Fish Department said, wisely said, I think, two of the most important gifts we can give our children are the ability to use information to make wise decisions and a quality environment, a quality environment that includes all of these artifacts of a native landscape in which there are still choices left to be made. So I hope that now I've convinced you that native fish are part of the Foothills Restoration Forum. Thank you.